I just kind of working under this mistaken impression that you just naturally get promoted, things would naturally come to you. I guess this is a sort of side effect of most of what we do. You know, you're successful at school, at GCSE level, you're successful at A level, you keep going. You kind of don't really question it. So looking back, I had no real plan even of what I wanted to do with my life, uh, no real plan of how to progress in a career. So I started doing some reading, as most academics do. So went through some of these career guidance things. The main point being that you, you kind of have to take responsibility for your own career choices. Um, nothing just happens. It, it just doesn't come unless you kind of ask for it or specifically seek out to find something. So I decided one way or another I wanted to go back to research. Um, I suppose this is an important point that uh, it, it, it's well worth actually going through your hopes and aspirations with someone who knows you so that they can um, advise, advise you. So ultimately I decided to go back to research, which took a while, so I had to um, basically make sure I could afford it. Um, so I eventually got a job back at UCL. I was a postdoc then. Um, I, I started working developing some biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Because of my background in industry, I ended up doing most, mostly software development still. I then got a job building a software platform. Uh, so again, I was quite happy making more software. Uh, but by this point, people were starting to say, it, it, uh, essentially, I was just a guy that wrote software. I would, I would certainly never get a career at UCL or, or in academia. Because all I did really was, I think I've missed a slide somewhere. I've, I've pressed this button twice. No, sorry. So, obviously received some quite negative feedback that uh, really if I was just the guy that wrote software, you would never, it, it just wasn't academic enough. Um, I wasn't writing enough papers. Um, it just wasn't sort of, I wasn't the guy that would ever lead a research team. So eventually I had to switch. I, I basically decided I would have to switch to a research project. Eventually, obviously, I, I managed to pitch for lecturer and uh, associate professor. I, I know I'm glossing over this quite quickly. Uh, so, but eventually, the point being that I did eventually get there. So when I was uh, writing this talk, obviously, I, I, as you were talking, Claire, I actually remind, I haven't really even, haven't even mentioned the grants I didn't get. But the point being, I, wa I wanted to kind of compare what life uh, like basically, how did I adapt from being, firstly, in industry, uh, then becoming a postdoc, uh, realizing that actually the way that you work, uh, what I was basically trained to do in industry doesn't work very well in academia. It was a fair process of adaptation, uh, and I found life as a postdoc quite stressful. So when I got my job, I thought, this is great. I would be able to behave like a PhD student, which meant no response. <laughs> You're laughing. Uh, so postdocs do have more responsibilities, more distractions. Uh, the job's more interesting than working in a bank. You know, overall, I did enjoy my job. Uh, it was more rewarding uh, than working in banking. But I found it very, very uh, frustrating, I guess, or, or, or just plain depressing, really. Because <laughs> however much, however many papers you had on your CV, it was never enough. Every time you spoke to your supervisor, it's like, well, you need to write a grant. Really, you need a fellowship, otherwise you'll never get a job. So, uh, whilst you're doing that, uh, you probably need to do more and more teaching. Uh, and you go round and round in circles, essentially being told you need more and more of everything. So you realize that there's, there is no upper bound on any of these metrics. Um, I think there's probably several <coughs> ways you can respond to this kind of input. But I was one of those persons that got somewhat depressed and then every time somebody else got a paper, I also got somewhat jealous of them, thinking that they're getting further ahead in their career than me. Uh, so mental note, never compare anyone's CV with your own. Um, so it sort of set me thinking, like, why is... I mean, we're working in quite a privileged part of society where if you have a, if you have a research job, I mean, it should be fantastic. We, we all believe that we're benefiting mankind in some way. Um, UCL engineering is to change the world, so it sounds this is this should be fantastic and exciting, and yet day by day I found it quite just difficult. The, the temptation then, with all these kind of 
uh, items is that you simply believe you have to work harder and harder and harder, which is obviously, naturally, I, I, I would say what, what most people in this room would do. Like, we've all been quite successful at studying on average. So when there's a problem, you go and study some more and just work harder and harder until it goes away or they give you a certificate or something. So <laughs> I'm very reward-driven. No. <laughs> so the, the point being that the overall mental impression was that if you don't have enough of grants, pay, whatever, is that you as a person are not good enough. So speaking as a sort of team leader now, that, that certainly isn't the intention, but it's somewhat a side effect uh, of, of the system that we're in. So I thought, oh, well, maybe some more career planning would go well. So, yeah, so this is where I was getting some very generally negative advice. I had to make sure I was on a research project or else I wouldn't be taken seriously as a researcher. Um, so looking back now, having done both industry where there's a whole bunch of different frustrations and academia where there's a sort of different set of frustrations, I think the, the main thing is that is, is the ability to find contentment kind of on a, in, in whatever you're doing of the moment. If ever you're trying to plan further ahead or you say, well, I just don't have enough papers, it's kind of a pointless state of mind. Um, it, it would be be so I was getting very hung up on the fact that I'm, I must keep working harder. I've, I've set out for however many years, and as, as the years tick by, five, six, seven, and I still haven't got my academic position, I therefore must be a failure. But really, if, looking back now, I would be happy in any industry job or any academic job if actually you find just ways of focusing on what you're doing and just delivering that thing. So there are these days many more ways of working. Uh, there's more opportunities, uh, different styles of job than th there was possibly back then. So if you look at, you know, every, 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 every system where you're working will have a whole bunch of metrics, you know, so in industry it's, it almost always boils down to profit and loss. In academia it might be papers, grants and, and teaching, but they're just the things of that system. It says actually nothing about essentially what, what you want or what you want to get out of life. So... In other words, these aren't the variables that you're trying to optimise in your life, if, if you see this as an optimisation <laughs> problem. <laughs> this, these are metrics of a system that are somewhat a side effect of what you're trying to achieve. These are the things that you may be trying to achieve, uh, and it, again, it sort of mirrors some of what Claire said, that it, it's probably the things outside work that are more important. So you're not trying to on a day-to-day -day basis, optimise these things, it's, it's these. Once you've decided you can, that these are actually more important, I, I came to the kind of conclusion, okay, so academia, if you look at what we're doing, any one of these could be a full-time job. So obviously, as a faculty member, you're probably doing more of these, uh, but a, a, and as a postdoc, you might be just more research and teaching, but ultimately, it's the same, it's the same problem if you keep going. If all of these can be a full-time job, at some point you have to accept that you will never complete what's on your to-do list, uh, which is itself stressful. So getting over that, and that doesn't mean just ignoring things blindly. Uh, it basically means you have to get back uh, and um, ruthlessly prioritise and work out what are the key and most important things you have to deliver, and then work out a method for delivering them. So... Uh, some of my mentor's phrases that spring to mind. Uh, one of them told me, uh, as soon as I got my lectureship, work out what to fail at, uh, which I thought was odd, but then I thought about, really this just means prioritisation. Um, we often think that we have to succeed at absolutely every task, but really, if you actually look at your to-do list, many of these things will wait. The only thing you should focus on is you know, the most important things. Um, you've always got to play to your strengths, um, certainly as you're, as you're looking for an academic position, there's no point necessarily trying to sell at an interview uh, things that are not you. Um, I had to learn all sorts about uh, diary management. You know, academics are typically planning three to six months in advance. 
all these skills that you need to develop, but they all basically boil down to working out what's important, what you have to deliver it, and prioritizing it. Uh, as I was kind of, again, working towards getting a lectureship, uh, even things like just blocking out distractions, if we all say that we have, you know, the temptation is to work harder and harder and harder and longer hours, but what you really should do is work more efficiently. So, for example, I, I worked out my best time of the day is, is the first two hours of the morning, so I'd come in very early. I know these things sound somewhat obvious, um, but then I, I got into the habit I, at the time I was, had a, I basically wanted to build a guitar, so I, 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 over, over a period of a few months, my, my, my work time, I'd come in, have a coffee, and think, I'll just, write, I'll just watch one YouTube video. Over a period of about a month, this kind of extended to about two hours of YouTube watching in the morning. <laughs> Um, and so it, you, you, have to, you have to actually analyze the data of what you're doing. Uh, so I installed URL blockers on all of my devices. <laughs> it was the only way to cure this strange addiction. Um, and also to work out, in terms of prioritizing the task that you have, it's, it's very tempting to say, well, I need another three, four, five papers before I can apply for a fellowship or an academic position. And you end up with sort of metrics like, the, or ambitions like this. You know, in one year's time, I must have this. Well, this is a, I would say, is a very bad way of doing it because, in all likelihood, it's not enough to make you do anything. Um, it's much better to say, I'm going to target this one paper. I've got a clear hypothesis. I can deliver this, and I will do it by the end of the month. So. Th these are kind of somewhat aspirational, but these are things that you could actually deliver and action and, and get on with. So overall, if you put this together, it's kind of, I came to the conclusion that I, I would actually be quite happy in either, in now, I would be, even now, I would be happy in an industry job or an academic job. In other words, my self-worth or my perception of myself is not dependent on whether I'm an academic. I basically just want an interesting job um, and so you then work out, okay, my day-to-day -day work or my day-to-day -day progression of what I'm doing is more to do with uh, career development. So I can, if I think I can learn this new skill now or I can learn the next skill, that's better than thinking just I must be an academic because then the things that you're working on are not contingent on the job or the status. Uh, They'll either come or they won't. I mean, at the end of the day, it does take a fair amount of luck being in the right place at the right time. Uh, and if it, if it didn't work out for me, I'd have just got a job in industry. So ultimately, it's not about working harder and harder and harder to achieve a title. It's, it's working about just basically, this is what I can do to for, you know, improve my CV, progress my career in the immediate future, and having short and medium-term goals and not being depressed about some long-term future that may or may not happen. I mean, this, this also does become more relevant, I think. Um, yeah, certainly life moves on anyway. For example, it was quite difficult doing all this, you know, once I'd had kids. So you've got a whole different bunch of perspectives anyway. So there's no point getting too hung up, as a, I, I don't think, on necessarily that title. It's, it's far better just to work at what you can do feasibly. So in conclusion, you do need some kind of plan. You need to know what you're aiming for. This was just some quote that someone said to me, but, but basically it's, it suggests that uh, you do have to be prepared to make changes. You do have to be prepared to do things you know, differently, uh, not repeat the same patterns and expect some magic to happen. I would say it's, it's better to focus on things you can deliver than necessarily any specific title. Uh, and it's all, I would say it's all really about what you want to achieve rather than the metrics of the system that you're working in. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you.